We'll be covering a webinar here today on just <clears throat> how you can look to reduce your infrastructure costs by really moving beyond, uh, I think, the, the traditional concept of ML ops. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, we'll just start to give you a, a quick intro uh, on the company and on who we are and what we do. So many of you may be familiar with us from either PyTorch Lightning or from uh, Grid.ai. Obviously, PyTorch Lightning being the open source project that's gained uh, a lot of traction and Grid being you know, the, the company that was supporting it and creating uh, an enterprise product. Now, we, we have evolved just as a, a company and as a vision, which we'll get a lot more into on uh, into Lightning AI. But some of our, our kind of stats there, just showing some of the traction that we're in, um, as well as, you know, we have a, a great set of investors that really believe in, in this vision. And so we're excited to share a lot more with you there. Uh, so if we go to the next one, it can just give a, a quick intro. Uh, I obviously am, am Mike uh, on the right there. The, the hair kind of gives it away um, or lack of hair. But yeah, mark, uh, run marketing here at Lightning AI and super excited about getting to work with, uh, with Luca and with the, the rest of the Lightning team who have built you know, this fantastic product and, and community. So Luca, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself a little bit here. Yeah, for sure. I'm Luca Antiga and CTO here at Lightning. Uh, I, of course, am super honored to uh, work with this team. We're kind of uh, trying to fulfill our uh, mission, which is uh, you do the science, we do the engineering. So we're trying to do the engineering as much as possible so you can focus on um, you know, working at the problems that you have uh, in building AI systems and AI applications um, and without uh, necessarily uh, knowing the full spectrum of things that you need to know to build those things from scratch. Awesome. Yeah, it's great. And yeah, I, I think uh, folks in the, in the, you know, ML world are, are probably familiar with Luca based off of the, uh, the book that he's done as well as uh, all of the core work on, on PyTorch and being kind of a core contributor there. So we're, we're super excited to have him and the rest of the, the team here to, to help to really give the community, I think a, a product and a project that's going to, help everybody move a little bit faster and do a little bit better work and, and kind of uh, advance the state of AI as we know it. So if we go to the, the next slide, I think the, the core concept of what we're talking about here is that building ML products or just really making progress in the field of, of AI uh, machine learning is hard. There's a lot that goes into it no matter what. And there's really not a great way of avoiding that. So if we get into the next slide and look at a couple of those challenges, you know, there's really three things that we see as being major barriers to someone getting started or, uh, you know, an organization making meaningful progress in, in how they create products or, uh, you know, advance their research. And I think the, the three major things here that need for diverse expertise, right? So, you may be somebody who's extremely uh, gifted and talented and knowledgeable about building models, training models, that aspect of the entire funnel, but there's just so much more that goes into actually having a, a production ready system. And so that is something that, you know, whether you're a, an individual working on a, a research project or you're trying to build out an actual system for a product at a, a large or small company, you're going to run into this challenge that it's very hard for just a single person or even a small team to have all the expertise that you need to be able to make a really stable and, and high-performing system. And a big piece of that is really the second part uh, that goes into it, which is that the infrastructure requirements are so uh, high for ML products. It's not just you know getting the model right, but then everything that's needed to support it, to scale it, to have it be you know really functioning in a uh, sort of a production environment you know, today, I think we we look at it as this has really been limited to the realm of big tech because of all of the the different folks that you need in it. It's very hard to get started unless you've already invested, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars and, you know, months, if not years into building out a platform that's going to be able to support it. And then this third piece is really looking at the overall ecosystem of just there are so many different frameworks, there are so many different tools, and they're always evolving, always changing. And what that results in is that if your tool sets aren't working together well, it becomes a major problem and a major time sink just trying to get them to actually communicate well together and work together as part of your workflows. 
So we'll dig into really all of these areas one by one. I think the first thing we want to talk about is just the the expertise and, and skill hurdle that you need to make a, a true ML product uh, and how big it actually is. So if we take a look at this and Luca, I'll sort of ask you, I mean, you have uh, obviously a lot of experience in helping to build you know, machine learning products. When you think of just you know, ML ops as a practice or, or this entire machine learning life cycle, how, how have you seen that, I guess, be a challenge either for, for yourself or for clients that you've worked with in, in past companies? What, what are some of your thoughts, I guess, on just what some of those barriers really are in, in the complexity in it? Yeah, I mean, uh, ML ops today uh, has its roots in, in, in DevOps and, and uh, uh, best software engineering practices, with the exception that the ML space is a lot less mature and it's, if you will, a, a, a lot more complex because even the, the notion of what uh, testing means for, a, for uh, an ML model, right? And everything that's not just the ML model, but what stays around the ML model is very extensive and it's growing by the day. So the number of tools is also growing and how to actually build everything in a cohesive fashion uh, is not entirely clear. So there's a lot of uh, bespoke systems. There are some end-to-end -end platforms. Um, sometimes the end-to-end -end platforms are not exactly what you need or what your application needs because of course, you know, ML can be deployed in so, you know, such a varied uh, range of configurations from a, a purely class system to the edge and so on. So it's really about knowing what you should know uh, so that you can patch everything together. And that requires uh, a lot of flexibility and uh, a lot of competences as you were mentioning before. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you, it's one of the fundamental pieces where one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, I think if you look at that next slide or if we go on to it, you know, you kind of get an idea of just how many different people are involved in this process and how many different skills. And I don't know, at least for, for mere, mere mortals, I think like most of us, the idea that you have to be great at all of these things to really make a high performing system, or you have to actually build a team with all of this expertise is really challenging because it's, it's not only about, um, you know, kind of, do you know that you need to do these things and, and do you are you actually aware of all the the challenges you're going to encounter but then can you hire people who are really strong at them or, or do you have a solution that's going to help it um i mean i'm assuming you you've worked in teams where they've encompassed just kind of all of these aspects and would love to to hear a little bit uh about that if if you would uh yeah for sure yeah i've worked um in uh in varied envir environments you know with ai in production in the past um, and well, at the beginning it was the early days. So we, we were kind of thinking about how software is done and how you know AI might be uh, set up to work in a production environment. Um, and it's not that you cannot start if you don't have all of this, but for sure at some point in your production journey, um, it will stick out as a thorn thumb that you kind of need one piece of this. So nowadays in 2022, how you get into the into things? So it's not 15 anymore. It's not 16 anymore. You know, uh, your customers will will kind of assume that you know how to do all these things because you know it's best practice at this point. So uh, how can we encapsulate the learnings from the past into something that can be made available, right, to to companies that do not have all these uh, uh, different personas uh, available, but still you know, uh, want to get into the business and, and get real with AI. So that's a, the big conundrum. And I think, you know, the MLOps space is advancing towards this with many uh, great tools, um, but still it's it's a hard job and it takes it still takes a lot of people and a lot of knowledge. Yeah, I think connecting all those tools in and of itself uh, is, is a challenge or knowing how to connect them, having an easy way to do that. And of course, I think that, that gets into a little bit of, of what we'll be talking about today. Um, so, you know, as you're you're looking at this, how I guess Sorry. you know, if we, <laughs> it's all right. No, I, I think the the big shift here is so how are you know uh, from the Lightning product? Obviously, this is something that you've been working on. How are how are we looking at fixing or addressing some of these issues? Yeah, so um, I'm assuming that one way or the other, 
the people that are listening know about what PyTorch Lightning has been up until now. Um, and I was mentioning you do the science lightning with do the engineering, and it's kind of been that way since the beginning. Since there was a trainer doing basic things that was sitting, not really wrapping your PyTorch model, right? It's not like um, a Kera style wrapping of uh, you know of TensorFlow or something like that. Um, it's more, I, I'm, and I'm not kind of bashing uh, Keras at all. It's a great product. It's just that PyTorch Lightning is a bit different. It stays alongside, it provides new uh, abstractions to your standard uh, PyTorch code so that PyTorch plus Lightning uh, gives you superpowers, but you're still writing models in, in PyTorch. Um, so if you think about that and the way uh, PyTorch has grown um, and what it, it has represented, for model development is it has kind of uh, uh, evolved the way people are building models today. And that comes with the cost component as well, right? Because if you iterate less, if you do things right the first time, or if you organize things in a way that a team can operate effectively on a code base, which are all things that PyTorch Lightning uh, let you do since uh, 2019 and 2020, um, so that that all fits into to this picture of uh, lowering cost overall overall costs, um, and it doesn't really change the way um, uh, things are done uh, today in the new abstractions that we introduce into Lightning in the LML of space. But I would like to kind of go through what the, the approach that PyTorch Lightning took to solve this problem, so that we can see the new things that are landing in Lightning as a natural evolution towards systems. Great. So yeah, option A, build your own, which means you have PyTorch, kind of raw PyTorch. Uh, you write your training loop, uh, which works because if you need to kind of implement your model or you have a new idea for a new model or you need to kind of apply a model that you found somewhere to your data, yeah, you, you need to kind of sometimes reverse engineer the code a bit if it's not kind of standardized in a certain way and PyTorch Lightning, uh, Lightning plus PyTorch is something that uh, brings standardization into your code. But you can still do everything. It's not that you cannot do something. It's only that you will do it in your own specific way. So if you're a solo developer, this works pretty great because you, you can write you know code that conforms to your way of doing things. The moment, the moment you need to get closer to production, the moment people that are not you will kind of look at your code, have to deal with it, um, but also yourself in you know scaling up how the problem is, you know how you you know get data or how you uh, deploy to to uh, to downstream tasks and so on. So all these things will begin to layer uh, um, on themselves, and then you can have a complexity that you need to be able to manage. Um, the other solution. For example, as a company that has a machine learning problem to solve and doesn't want to kind of get artistic uh, with with uh, you know new models and so on, is just you know get a get an endpoint that you can call so that you can actually get a response from it. Of course, you know these are two ends of a spectrum, so this could be option Z, right? Um, one is maximum flexibility; the other one is an inflexible thing, uh, uh, but it might get the job done. So what we uh, uh, did with uh, PyTorch Lightning um, uh, is in starting yeah, 2019, 2020, is given a way for you to organize your PyTorch code so that it's still your custom PyTorch code, but organized in such a way that the, the abstraction that uh, PyTorch Lightning brought, uh, which is the trainer, could understand your intent. So what these fragments of the code were, so it could call them in the right order and so on and take them apart and interleave the engineering around it. So you didn't even have to change a line to kind of launch a distributed training. And so think about the money that you saved going from serial implementation to distributed just by changing a flag in the trainer, right? It reminds um, me a and, bit of, yeah. of just, you know, the uh, obviously coming from the more of the API world and sort of the traditional DevOps world, it reminds me a bit of problems that we would see with people that they were solving with APIs of, you know, you get a lot of spaghetti code in there. It's like you might have a giant thing of Java, 
And it's really hard to, for if another developer is coming on to understand what's going on because it's not standardized. Would you say that that's kind of similar in this where there's that debugging issue or like understanding the actual code itself issue in this? Yeah, it's a maintainability issue, which translates into kind of things can get as complex as you can allow yourself to go with the structure that you have, right? So as you hit the ceiling of complexity, the things become untenable because you didn't structure it correctly in the first place. So what do you do? You rewrite everything and so on. This is the kind of tech debt pile of work that goes into your sprint that is there until you land on the right abstractions, right? And right. then you don't think about that stuff anymore. So that thing is something you shouldn't think about. And if you're spending cycle there, then you're probably not spending cycle where you should spend it. So this is why I think, you know, PyTorch Lightning caught up uh, during the years. Um, and to, to have a build your own, so complete flexibility, um, but without the boilerplate. So the boilerplate is the engineering, you know. Um, and for example, the engineering that allows you to distribute uh, your training to a parallel one, but even like simpler things like, you know, early stopping and so on, like do things or implementing metrics. There's a, a, a great uh, project called Met Metrics in the PyTorch ecosystem that will um, calculate metrics efficiently, quickly, and correctly so that you don't need to write your yet another accuracy metric that maybe not the accuracy, but some other and a more sophisticated metric that ends up being incorrect. So you have to backtrack and so on. So it's all about reusing stuff. Uh, I see a question here. Let's, um, um, yeah, for sure. We can share them after. Um, the uh, there, there are many great books around MLOps. So uh, we can share uh, afterwards. Although what we're saying here in this, <laughs> in this webinar is, yes, you, you will do your job better if you read a book about MLOps but you may be able to do your job really well, even if you're not proficient with all the spectrum of MLOps. But, you know, if you're getting into it, it's good to, to learn well, what, you know, you're, uh, we're talking about. Sure. Um, let me get, step ahead. And, um, and so going back to the flexibility versus you know, other things uh, that you don't have if you just write like a raw thing. Um, you have this like duality, right? Do, do I say flexible or do I make things production grade, scalable, maintainable? We were talking about maintainability and you know, being capped in the level of complexity that you can generate just because you don't have the right encapsulation so that you can manage things at a higher level. I have the engine or do I have the pistons and the screw, right? If I have the engine, I can put it on a on a bike and build a motorbike, more or less. I had a friend who made a diesel Vespa at some point. <laughs> but you know, you can do weird stuff if you want. Um, the but Vespa if you need to reason about the, <laughs> yeah, if you need to kind of uh, think about the individual screws, probably you will never get to the diesel Vespa. And probably it's a good thing in that case, but it's not a good thing in general. Um, and what do you do about collaboration and modularity? What PyTorch or organized PyTorch, uh, you know, Lightning plus PyTorch, uh, brought to the field is you don't renounce flexibility, but now you don't have the flexibility versus something, but you have flexibility and all these other things together. And the price to pay is to organize your code in, in a way that it's dictated and opinionated, but it's not dictated in a way that will stop you from doing things flexibly. It just, you know, uh, break it up in a way that makes sense in general and that uh, 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 Lightning requires you, uh, for example, training step, you do a certain things and it's always like that. Um, then we have, for example, a way to loop that is standard, but we can also, you can also access a customizable way of, you know, uh, doing training loops. So it's not that you need to land on the most immediate thing, but you can also dig deeper and you know customize everything you want. But you shouldn't be doing the customize, customize everything you want every time you approach a problem, right? Only when you need it and if you need it. And most of the time you don't. And, and so this is the kind of the approach that PyTorch Lightning and uh, in general, and now Lightning at large is pushing forward. 
Makes sense. And uh, yeah, we always do this parallel, right? It doesn't take a lot. It just takes do whatever you do usually, but do it in a structured way. And then probably delete some code because it's code that it's kind of glues things together. So you don't need to do to, to take care of that. Because if you don't take care of that, Lightning will take, it will do those things that you were doing manually in between the red blocks before. Or if you switch a flag on the trainer, it will do many more complicated things. For example, to do distributed training, replacing the code that you didn't write with code that probably you don't know how to write <laughs> to really you know, uh, scale up the complexity of what you need to do. And this is the whole philosophy behind Lightning in general. So if I want to be able to, you know, you're, you're talking about the, the code that I didn't necessarily write, like using, uh, I'm going to run into situations and putting myself in the shoes of someone here. I'm going to run into situations where I might need to customize that code. Do I still have the ability to do that? Can I still make those changes? I guess if I say, hey, Lightning gave this to me in a certain way, am I able to still uh, make some of those changes underneath if I want to? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's a great level of flexibility to the point that I don't I don't know how many users are actually leveraging that level of flexibility. And in general, this has always been kind of uh, a very constructive interaction with the community where the community was more coming back with, oh, I cannot do this you know easily or I cannot do this at all. And um, the the core developers for Lightning were also always very open to kind of make it work. And this lead led to Lightning, uh, develop this level of flexibility. It wasn't designed that way at the beginning, but it's designed that way right now. And I would say that, yeah, you can basically do a very sophisticated things um, uh, right now and control basically everything. Uh, like Lightning itself, like the training loop itself is a loop that um, uh, is one of the customizable loops, essentially. So I am talking about loops, but there are also many other things. Um, that you can customize and, and have control on. And if you bump into one that doesn't have that, this level of flexibility, then just reach out. Yeah. It, it will be hard though. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Um, now we tackle training. Now what happens when you move beyond model? So how much, how much is the chunk in your sprints, in your work, in, you know, in engineering, that is related to making system talk to each other, like having a distributed system that, you know, with which you, you know, train your model, I don't know, take the data, transform it, and then deploy somewhere else, or, you know, monitor the execution of something. And how you, uh, how much time are you spending on keeping that alive and building it in the first place, maybe rewriting it once, <laughs> once or twice, and then deploying it scale, making sure that it, it's it's running and so on. So it's much of the same problem, right? There are some logic, high value logic, and there's the engineering around it. So if you spend too much time on the engineering around it, then you're gonna spend, given a, the same amount of budget that you have, uh, you're gonna stand, spend less time in actually understanding logic and making it evolve. Because if you don't have flexible abstraction, that engineering logic that you put there will block you, you from evolving the logic too much because you cannot break out of the construction that you, the scaffold that you created, right? So um, it's it's very much the same problem. Um, and yeah, you know, like this is a partial view of what MLOps is today, but it's an example, right? You have training, then you have to test the model, uh, deploy, and then uh, you gather the data, maybe, you know, uh, data that your model didn't perform well, so you actually, you know, monitor your model, your model, maybe you, you are monitoring drift in the, in some, uh, I don't know, intermediate layer, or even in the incoming data, you collect the more interesting data, you prep the data, you, you kind of understanding, or maybe you have an automated pipeline, and then you redo the training, you redeploy. Even this kind of quote, <clears throat> simple, which is not simple, uh, uh, kind of uh, life cycle has so many pieces into it that it's really hard to patch things up in a way that you can evolve them and build more and more complex and high level logic on top of the basics, right? If you don't have the right abstractions. And I think right now MLOps has this kind of challenge where 
uh, you it's really hard to manipulate higher order things and build system out of uh, this higher order thing. It's always kind of coming, always coming to taking the screws, going back to the diesel Vespa, uh, taking taking the screws and the pistons. Uh, so we did this with for for Py, with uh, PyTorch Lightning, which we now refer to as Lightning Plus PyTorch, and then we are introducing new abstractions to kind of be able to go and break out of the model building thing uh, and and tackle uh, more pieces of the MLOP space and really whatever pieces you you need to tackle. It's more a way of of addressing the question. How do I build an ML system that is just potentially distributed across machine without engineering getting in the way? Yeah, I think all these problems are, you know, hard enough that there's multiple companies, tools, et cetera, just focusing on these individual problems. So Absolutely. I guess in the way of, you know, looking at that tool ecosystem and sort of overall ecosystem that we were talking about, it feels like being able to, to make sure that things can communicate well between each other, just knowing how intricate and how time consuming each of these steps are becomes a, a pretty important part of, of making the entire system work. Is that a fair way to understand it? Oh, absolutely. So we, we are not implying that Lightning will cover all these boxes on its own. It's about, you know, how, and, you know, uh, Lightning plus PyTorch is the same thing. It's not that it has a, you know, opinionated logger or opinionated other things. It will ship logs to the logger of your choice, but it will do so just by specifying a callback or uh, specifying uh, some uh, trainer parameter so that you don't need to understand how, but you, you need to want the, the thing to speak to that other thing. And that's about that, right? So it, in the same spirit, we don't want to have a lightning uh, deployment that you need to use otherwise you're out of the lightning ecosystem yeah right or data gathering and so on it would be um, uh, very hard but the 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 connection between all these um, uh, blocks is what we're really interested in so how do you express the fact that you have different pieces and these pieces as you were saying a minute ago uh, need to talk to each other in a very specific way and some and going back to what we were saying before, when you know you go into production with AI, um, the one size doesn't fit all is particularly stringent there. Um, and being able to express this logic in a way that is natural through like just code, um, it's a uh, it's very important. And being able to like replicate your systems. And in such a way that a system can be an evolution of another one, or that you can reuse pieces of a system to express something different, uh, or even deploying on a different, uh, you know, cloud or cluster and so on. It's really, really valuable because it's the real blocker for your own evolution in you know, even understanding your problem and tackling it and so on. Yeah, I think the the risk factor of like lock and right is, you know, if you if you're locked into a you know, a uh, whatever data annotation uh, sort of service. And all of a sudden, six months later, something that comes out that is much more fit to your needs, much more, you know, powerful perhaps or cheaper, whatever it may be. Uh, the cost of, of switching can be enough to make you actually not do it because you'd have to rewrite to your point of what you were saying. Earlier. So I think there's, there's a lot of just, you know, sort of like risk mitigation and sort of cost optimization and knowing that you can switch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the build your own versus like the option A, like build your own, you go down, you write your Terraform, you you know interact with your uh, Kubernetes cluster, you manage things uh, with uh, with operators. Like you you can still do it, and there are great tools out there. Or target your uh, cloud APIs and so on. But of course, this requires an under a level of understanding that may be out of reach for some, or you know, it's not the best use of resources. Um, and again, by doing that, you're not focusing on what matters, which is the, the pink connections, like the how do I express these things uh, talking to each other in a, in a flexible way? 
And the other one is, you know, you buy a platform. There are many platforms out there. Um, and again, if that's what you need, go for it. Like it's it's fantastic. You have a a product that just fits your needs. Sometimes it doesn't. And you need something very specific to your needs. And I think this is in email, in, in email is, is really, really noticeable, right? And so what is the option A plus is build your own without the infra before it was without the engineering. It's, it's, it's the same thing, right? It's without the infra, without the engineering, without the ops. And do that in a way that it doesn't take a long time to, to do. Like you can unlock it in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And at the same time, that gives you the ability to swap things uh, one for the other or to write higher level logic that will work no matter what the actual component is. For example, you have a like a data annotation component. If you write a certain kind of uh, interface for that, that is standardized in your own system, then you will be able to just write that aspect on another data annotation part and then compose it in your system in a way that makes sense. Um, but to do that, you need a few abstractions. And this is what we kind of wanted to introduce um, into Lightning. Makes sense. And again, it's, it's the same slide as before because it's the same thing, essentially. <laughs> and it got into the same library. Uh, so yeah, this looked a bit, let's say, uh, uh, bold as a move, uh, but we strongly uh, think that the separation between infra and high level logic that you have today, most products, is a separation that it's a bit artificial and it derives from DevOps again. It derives from the way you deploy web services, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and that is probably something that makes sense in certain domains, but I'm, uh, we are more than convinced that in the ML domain, being able to express things in a way that you can say, okay, I have this high, like uh, uh, computationally uh, challenging thing that I need to kind of make, uh, to, to execute somewhere. Um, and I need to know about that thing continuously. I need to react to changes in the state of that thing. Um, and the way you prescribe like training in a trainer and so on, shouldn't be the, that separated. Because for example, if I have a, I, uh, hyperparameter optimization uh, process. The jobs that I will need to start kind of depend on what the trainer is telling me. So um, this artificial separation between the YAML world, the deployment world, the you know the comp compute world, and the the training logic world. Again, I find it really really artificial, and so we need to draw a line where the line is whatever the ML engineer is concerned with and what whatever the infra people are concerned with, which is, I think is a bit misplaced today. And this is what we're trying to fix with Lightning, giving more power to the ML engineer to kind of, you know, express things without actually the abstraction they would they sit upon leaking all the time. Oh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, persistent volume claim didn't succeed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. But <laughs> I need to talk to the DevOps people to even understand what that is, right? right. So rephrasing in one slide, yeah, it's, uh, Lightning takes care of, for example, how components, whatever they are, I will see, uh, communicate how the state of the whole ML system, which is a distributed system, evolves over time globally, like as a whole. Um, so I can reason about it. Uh, how the system is made fault tolerant. So if something uh, uh, breaks, I have the ability because you know in infra space yeah, in platform world everything breaks all the time right so uh so how can i absorb and write logic that can deal with well faults and how the system is deployed at scale so you don't have to the same way lightning plus pytorch this takes care of uh you know how do i distribute computation across nodes to do uh, ddp for example so we had uh, so you don't have a question come in yep. Luke, that was asking could we could you use lightning uh, on SageMaker or with SageMaker uh, for some of the folks here who are who are likely probably in that that world? Yeah, actually, um, um, it's the early days for for lightning and for components. So if you go to Lightning AI and we'll take a tour 
of the website and the gallery that we have, um, you will see a lot of third-party um, uh, tools like SageMaker being featured as components. So for sure, you can use you can both use PyTorch Lightning on SageMaker. That there's no uh, question about it. But you can you will also be able to use SageMaker as a component for a Lightning app and a Lightning ML system. So yeah, for sure, we we want to encourage kind of interoperability uh, between um, uh, services and managed services in general. Great. Uh, so with that, I think I, I, we, we can point you to actual resources um, uh, at the end of the, we'll, we'll publish them at the end of the, uh, at the webinar. Great. So we go forward, like a brief overview of what we're talking about. Lightning just acquired three new obstructions. There were like Lightning module, Lightning trainer, and then data module and so on in the past. Now there are like three new ones. Lightning flow, lightning work, and lightning app. We'll go through some of the nomenclatures so that we're good and we, we can you know, talk uh, in a more elaborate way uh, uh, during the rest of the webinar. But what those three abstractions allow you to do is to build what we call reactive ML systems. So um, which are ML systems that again uh, can uh, coordinate third-party managed or even non-managed, so compute perform onto our uh, infra uh, that you can reference as an object in Python, and that and a computing model that uh, it will take you like ten minutes to understand. Uh, so it's really quick once you get into it, but it it looks uh, uh, a bit different uh, the first time you read about it. But you're already used to it if you program in Streamlit or um, if you ever did React uh, frontends, which is there's a run method that runs continuously. And so what that means is that it's called multiple times. It's always executed on top of, and it reevaluates re itself against a state, which is represented by the uh, attributes of this class, which is derived from lightning flow, which is you know, logic that flows. So whatever attributes this flow drive class has uh, is part of a state and changes in the state or the state of the children of this class because it, this flow can contain other flows that are nested into it, uh, will come out with different outcomes. And so you can make, you know, different decisions based on the evolution of these variables. So you can have uh, like third party service somewhere, like for example, a data notation, that you know even stays up for ten days. At some point, uh, users will have annotated like uh, the next thousand thing batch, and this logic will kind of reevaluate itself. You will see that the annotations has reached a number that can be divided by thousand. So uh, we will then uh, have some kind of dog like structure where you run. Uh, one step at a time through the thing. So, you know, fetch my data, put it there, transform the data, put put it in a feature store. And then again, in a reactive way, this feature store will say, okay, I have new features that have not been kind of uh, seen by anyone. So you can write that part of the logic and say, okay, whenever a feature store has new features, then you will kind of train your model again. And there are ways to express the fact that this logic should stop on this run and kind of bounce back until the train run is executed or just go through it in a kind of parallel fashion. But once you master this, you can write systems that are distributed, that, that live in different parts. And you, you can even distribute write raw compute over uh, on the cloud. And then, but at the same time, uh, it's just one Python piece of logic, uh, but every component will make every other component aware of state changes. Uh, and as, as I was mentioning, there's a kind of tree-like uh, arrangement that makes makes it, uh, uh, like that dictates that information flows from the top, which is whatever I pass to my Lightning app, which is the runner. Like you, can, you need to think about the app as the trainer in, in trainer world. So the app is a runner that will run a root flow, which is in this case, an instance of production pipeline, which is my lightning flow. 
that can contain other things in, inside it in a tree-like fashion. So these components could also be composition of other components. So this tree will have a state and every node in this, in this tree will know everything about the, the children, but know nothing about the parents. And this enables um, a reactive system that is actually composable because every component will never assume that it's contained in, in anything. Um, and uh, the evolution of state will be uh, kind of observable from the outside. Uh, so you, you can debug the system by observing state transitions. And at the same time, uh, this state could represent things that happen across the cloud. So at this point, you don't need to know how to make components communicate with each other. All they need to do is publish some state so that the rest of your logic can react to it. Uh, and this takes care of a lot of engineering and we'll do that for you, right? So if, if you deploy it on the cloud and we'll see it in a minute, there will be systems of queues, things, logic that you know you don't need to know that they are there, so that you know we can take care of the engineering, and you need only to focus on how your logic looks here. So the way things are in most systems today, and of course you know you have kind of uh, streams and uh, and like event streams and, and so on that makes things more complex, but usually uh, MLOps systems are made with um, with what we call DAGs, like they're, they're like scheduled executions of, or pipelines, right? Uh, of different blocks of logic. And an output of one will go into the input of another one. And a lot of, of the logic we talked about a minute ago happens in this kind of edges, not within the, the orange boxes, right? What we're saying today is what if you can write the whole logic in a composable manner. So instead of writing, like taking care of all those arrows that connect one block to the next block, what if this could be in a in something that allows you to express really complex logic, including you know if conditions, loops, and so on. Uh, and then each one of these will can coordinate uh, uh, pieces of like significant portion of compute, which we call work. You remember there were three abstractions, lightning app, lightning flow, and lightning work. Lightning work doesn't work this way. Like it's not like continuously reevaluating itself. It's more, this is long running, significant compute, but it behaves in the same way. It exposes state to its parents. So flow will be able to, if, if there's a training running on work A, maybe there is, a, a, is even a training working on uh, running on work B, maybe it's part of a multi-node uh, uh, run, uh, the state updates that come from that, like epoch ended or whatever you know, a metric uh, fell below a threshold, or this is the value of the metric so that the flow can say, oh, this fell below a, a certain threshold, right? And it can take care of that part. So the deltas of the state are always communicated up and you can really write a distributed systems this way, but you haven't written a single line dealing with HTTP requests, you know, uh, and so on, and a lot of database uh, handling and uh, and so on. And just like this, there are many other things, like for example, you can expose UIs um, uh, or you can exchange data in a certain way. Uh, and we're kind of uh, increasing the number of things that you can do uh, as we make the framework evolve. Very cool. Um, yeah, and by the way, state, I, I said it's observable. It contains references to all the checkpoints that are written. So actually you can serialize the state, put it somewhere, take it down the whole system, revive it, present it with a new state, and you can resume your, your, your system again, which has a lot of implications for fault tolerance, um, but also for being able to just pause and resume things or even upgrade the system to a new version without everything breaking uh, 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 under you, right? Um, of course, all I'm saying, it's already in the framework. Um, we are very actively developing every one of these things. Luca, I, perhaps it's just my... A particular case in which we, you know, in which we...
And for the OPSI uh, people um, uh, that want to understand kind of what is uh, uh, beneath the surface, um, what we did is basically abstract a lot of what you see here, which is actually what is under the, the, the level of the flow and work abstractions. Um, for example, there's compute clusters, there are cloud providers, there are queues, there are state management, um, and there's a you know a, a drive. It's a, it's an abstraction of storage, and 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 there's ingress that um, regulates how users access the flow and the the UI is supposed from by flow and work. So all these things are still very controllable and. Uh, up to a point, they're customizable. So I'll talk in a minute about deployment options here, but if you have an infra team that wants to kind of actually peek under the hood and take care of this uh, lower part of the stack, then they still are still able to make changes there while the ML engineers don't all only like take care of, you know, building a model, but actually build a whole system, a whole distributed system and manage it. And this separation allows the two teams to kind of work without uh, getting into each other's feet, a lot more than than is true today with with tools that are there today. Awesome, and I'm conscious. I want to make sure we we have a chance to actually go through the demos and those things. And we're we're about uh, yep. four or five minutes in now. Um, so if we want to go to the the, the next slide quickly, uh, I think yep. we covered a lot of this from my side already, but just. You know, everything we've talked about is really getting at this idea that machine learning infrastructure is it's complex and it's expensive. And if we look at that next slide, I, I think it again is really what we've already talked about that even if you're just looking at something that's relatively simple, there is that harder cost that is easier to understand, right? It it costs money to develop and train a model, it costs money to serve a model. You can see that on you know your AWS, Azure, GCP bill. It's it's right there for you. It's very obvious. But then there's all what I consider to be more of the soft cost, right? And these are the things that you were getting to of where it's really looking at time for folks that's going into it and, you know, time for, for team members who are, are valuable and could be put in uh, into more, you know, the, the sort of model development or, or product innovation aspects of it versus just trying to make the infrastructure works when that's maybe not their like core competency or something that they're very... Um, you know, uh, super familiar with. And I think we, if we go to the next slide, there was a, um, you know, I, I think just looking at this, this is sort of what uh, I think a lot of the abstraction that we've been talking about helps you to avoid of having to, to do uh, all of these different pieces that may come into play. But what it really helps you to avoid is the situation on the next slide, which is that you have uh, folks spending uh, an outsized amount of their time really on these uh, these infrastructure concerns of managing the cloud, you know, managing hardware, configuring tools, uh, integrating things, debugging uh, systems that are are difficult to really understand, versus you know working on either new models or um, finding you know new insights, building new products on top of models, and the business outcome of that, you know, we've seen this with a a lot of our uh, customers and the folks that we're working with uh, and community members is just that it makes your operating expense go very high very quickly and puts a large barrier in place of it, uh, it makes it a little bit more challenging to actually capture revenue because you're you're spending so much of your time, it's hard to, to tell where a system might be having an issue, right? If you have a performance issue, it may not be your serving. It may be something else that's harder to understand because the code is so complicated. And just overall, as you're trying to, to rapidly innovate, getting to that uh, or rapidly put new new models into the market or put new products into the market, that slowdown that you have that is associated with either a, a very brittle system that you can't really change or a, a system that, you know, uh, makes it challenging to, you know, extend to something that you need or you can't understand it, it just slows your entire product process down. So in the instance of where you have, you know, your uh, the the metas, the Googles, et cetera, of the world where you have massive organizations dedicated to this, they're still having this problem. Uh, and they've invested tons of time, tons of money uh, into building these platforms. So I think that, you know, that setup that you have of looking at, do you want to start from scratch and kind of build it the whole way up? Or do you want to, 
you know, uh, take advantage of some abstractions that exist. To me, it, it reminds me a lot of, of just the infrastructure tools in general, where that's why Kubernetes exists is because nobody wanted to write the logic to manage their, you know, their containers once sort of Docker caught on. So I look at this as, as something where it's that same idea of just a, a next level of abstraction that I think allows people to have more of that focus on the business logic and more focus on the the kind of product or or uh, like innovation value. Not to use too many. Yeah, absolutely. And there was a question. Yeah, there was a very you know on point question. Does ML engineer need to learn Kubernetes and show me the slides? We we didn't say that. You know, when we showed uh, the slide, um, this slide, <laughs> uh, we weren't telling you that you need to deep dive into this and go beyond the right line. You can stay completely above the white line, learn lightning, and then deploy at scale in the cloud on a Kubernetes cluster without knowing that you're actually on a Kubernetes cluster because lightning will take care of the engineering for you, right? So you want to learn it? Yeah, I mean, why not? You, But of course, we have a finite amount of time in our lifetimes and we need to learn what our, our bottles are. So the level at which you learn it, it's good if you kind of read a kind of a, an introductory book just to know what the problem, what the, are the problems that it's trying to solve. It's arguable that some of the properties that Kubernetes has, especially in the training world or in the large like uh, workload kind of world. Uh, are exactly the right tool for the job. Uh, we're we're using a lot of Kubernetes in, behind, but um, under the hood. But the one of the the points is that you know Kubernetes gives you the ability to make fault tolerant services and so on that can you know go down and you don't even notice uh, because you know that they will uh, run, uh, get back up and then it does beam packing. It does a lot of things for you, but some like a training workload probably will not use those <laughs> because you you will probably want to run on a whole instance and if it goes down it's not that say oh i i bring it up <laughs> i lost the thing if i don't set it up correctly i actually lost my job so you cannot just take it down spin up somewhere else i don't want that so if you ever use kubernetes to 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 do machine learning you have to use one of the of something that stays on top of it or you really need to know how to use it to actually configure it so that it doesn't work against you. So yeah, you know, take all this as a grain with a grain of salt, but this is the gist of it. So uh, uh, it's not required unless you want to know how things are under the hood. In this particular case, it's not required because we have a kind of a clear separation between that level and the level of flowing work, which is more abstracted as Mike was saying earlier. Um, and, uh, so yeah, what you can do here with Lightning is as an ML engineer, you can go to our website and we'll do it in a second. Start from a template, use the template as is, or we'll have a few flagship apps out there uh, in the next few months that uh, will make it worth to go to Lightning even if you're not interested in the framework itself because there will be like, for example, we'll start from where, you know, <laughs> from training of course, um, because we're we're kind of, it's our bread and butter, right? So we'll deliver an app that is super great at training that offers you flexibility that it's open source. So you will be able to take that and kind of, you know, do the fancy multi, multi node HBO, you know, interactive thing that we'll do, but within your own kind of logic. So you will be able to use that app as a component, but you will kind of benefit from all, everything that we do that we know about how to do training properly, right? So you can start from a template like that, or even a simpler one with code that you know it will be simpler to understand, and then use as is or customize it using Python, and then just using like Lightning run app app.py dot dash dash cloud just deployed at scale on top of Kubernetes and uh, in a distributed fashion, and then something that you will be able also to do is to share it. And share it doesn't mean you share the working the running system. You share the template the code for your, your application. Down the road, you will, yeah, not too mm, far ahead in the future, we're thinking about ways in which you will also be able to monetize. Because if you build a system 
And many people will kind of clone and run and will know what this means in a second. So we'll choose to kind of do this operation where they take one app with its code and so on, and we'll spin up a whole mini ML platform, right? Um, that is based on your code and they will do it for their own needs. This thing will be, this thing will be very evident. So it's your thing that gets spin up. And so you will be also able to engage as in a, an open source uh, 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 way or in other ways uh, and make your work uh, available to others from a systems perspective, which is kind of, you know, uh, a new thing for, for us. And, uh, or for yourself, like you have a large organization, you need to spin up like five or 10 of these systems, maybe on uh, different clusters because you have kind of uh, AWS credits as a startup, you know, or GCP credits, you will be able to do all this and kind of spin up parts of your infra in a reproducible way uh, and uh, you know, on, on the different clusters and manage them all from the Lightning, uh, 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 main Lightning app. And talking about deployment options, something we want to touch base on is uh, we have a fully managed, like if you go on lightning.ai today, uh, you the, the app you interact from and the, the thing that kind of orchestrates when you push an app to it, then it makes it happen and so on. Um, and the management of users and so on, it's the control plane, right? So the control plane is managed by Lightning AI in the managed, in, in the managed world, but every compute, so the, the app instance, the yellow thing, the yellow wedge I showed a slide before, so the whole system will come up in a different cluster, which is the compute cluster. If you do that by default on lightning.ai today, it will be spun up on a Lightning AI managed compute cluster, which is a large cluster that we manage. But we also have what we call BYOC, bring your own compute, uh, which maintains the all the management layer, blah, 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 managed by Lightning, so you don't have to care about that but it allows you to spin up the compute cluster under your own credentials in your own VPC, so fully securely. And also you can use your AWS credits or GCP credits or Azure credits uh, to spin it up, right? Uh, to, to run it. Uh, so you can run your, your workloads, you can have your uh, apps doing training uh, on your own, in your own VPC. If you're an enterprise, probably you, you don't want to make the further step if you're a kind of a startup or you know, so on, unless you have a regulatory requirement. If you do, or if you're a, a kind of a large enterprise that has, again, some regulation that are, can, can be internal or imposed by the field you're working on, you can deploy everything in air-gapped environments where uh, control plane is in your own VPC and uh, the compute is also in your own VPC. This is something that we do ad hoc with individual companies uh, because of course it puts, you know, a bit more burden on everyone to make it happen because of the various constraints that might uh, come up. But we have the full spectrum of possibilities here to make uh, uh, Lightning something useful for, for everyone. And for that, bring your own Maybe. VPC. Yep. Could it just be, yep. you know, I have uh, a bunch of, NVIDIA GPUs around that are attached that I that I actually kind of have on my own like rig, would I be able to use those as well if I wanted? Not today, but um, probably not in a too distant future. Um, we're seeing more and more that, you know, the non-cloud option, like I own hardware, uh, the, like the cost benefit there, it's really specific to uh, what you need to do. I've worked in organizations where you know, there were like um, a few workstations going 24 seven. And if we had to run them uh, to train stuff, the way we were doing this um, uh, on the cloud, we would have like exorbitant costs. Sometimes though you have the need for elasticity. So I think the future is more like hybrid. So right now we're targeting the cloud, um, but we'll surely uh, look into kind of own compute uh, really soon. Awesome. Um, all right. So yeah, we had a, a few other slides to show, but I think it's good if we switch to an actual demo. <laughs> yeah, I think we can hop into it. Uh, I think, you yep. know, so much of what we're going to show is uh, kind of already been covered at least verbally around the, the ecosystem yep. and just how complex it is. So 
more than anything else, why don't we show off some of how this actually works? Because I think that's you know what a lot of folks want. Yeah. To do. Right. So um, what we said is Lightning is just a library. So you pip install Lightning, and by pip installing Lightning, you get both the trainer world and the new flow work world. You can still get the trainer world using pip install pytorch underscore lightning, but that will be probably in the in some future because we don't want to break everybody's code uh, right now. So in some distant future will be uh, 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 probably sunset with some version, which could correspond to a major uh, version release. Uh, but for now, like if you start a new uh, project using the trainer, just go pip install lightning and uh, it's the more most future proof way you can approach this. Our homepage, it's actually kind of explaining what I just said uh, today and uh, probably better <laughs> than I than I did. Um, so it it's made, I just want to point out to you folks that you can click here and actually get a lot of clarifications out of this uh, pieces of information. So you can draw like a overall picture. So what is Lightning? Uh, where can I run Lightning apps? You can run them uh, for, uh, free uh, on local or on the cloud. You will get free credits if you log in on the clouds and the free credits will renew every month. So you actually, if you have like needs that are like, I need to run something for some time or a small application for the whole month, you can do it for free. Um, and then the private BPC stuff and, uh, and examples of uh, what for workflows uh, Lightning enables and a few features uh, to kind of uh, you know, show off what we have under the hood. Um, and something that we'll visit right now is the templates, what we would call the apps that we are in our gallery. And you can submit new apps to the gallery if you want. Probably in the future, we'll make prior, like personal profiles a bit more like uh, more like a gallery. So you can get a lot of visibility just by sharing your profile for now. This the visibility part is through the gallery, um, and uh, what you can do as a standard workflow is find a template, like we uh, said uh, previously. Uh, you can click watch to preview it if it's running. So this is a running instance of that system, but most likely you want to spin up your own instance of that thing, right? Because if you're interacting on a demo instance, you're not going to do a lot. You need to think about Lightning apps as apps for your iPhone and your account on Lightning is like the iPhone itself. So if you go to um, somebody's public profile or uh, to the gallery and you do clone and run, and we'll, we'll see in a minute uh, through a specific button there, you will actually install the whole asset to your phone, the, your app, physical, like quote, physical app on your phone and launch it. Uh, uh, as opposed as you know, peeking into a running app on another uh, another person's phone. So most likely you want to do this. Um, you can also download the code and modify and run locally or on the cloud really easily. Lightning run app app.py or dash dash cloud to push to our cloud. Okay, let's go to the meet, which is the gallery. You can see here apps gallery. These are the galleries, uh, the, the the apps that uh, you can access. Many of these apps are meant to represent things that are useful in themselves, but also starting points for you to customize. For example, uh, we have different types of them. Uh, one very interesting one that I kind of um, uh, uh, suggest you look into is the PyTorch Lightning app, uh, which basically turns any code that uses the trainer into an app that you can use to train your models interactively, even locally. It gets you a very nice environment where your own training code will run with no code changes. So if you have an app that uses trainer, sorry, you have a training script that uses trainer, that training script is automatically turned into an app and you can run it and you can see the, the, the logs and so on. Um, it, it's really, really interesting. What I wanted to show today it's a different app, which is more systemy, so that we also show off, uh, you know, spinning up uh, new machines uh, 
which is the Scratch, Scratch Bot app, uh, which is a notebook manager for teams. So if you have a team, um, and again, this is a kind of more of an example app. Uh, if you have a team, you can, uh, and we'll see that in a second, um, uh, start this app and then start a notebook on a GPU instance or a CPU instance. Uh, and then uh, the different members of your team can interact with, with actual notebooks. And these are actually physical instances that get spun up on demand. And then there's a notebook manager flow that kind of orchestrates the presence of these uh, different things and also their, their ability to push um, uh, binary files to uh, common storage and so on. Um, here you can clone and run. So you can just clone the app raw. Uh, what I wanted to show you is that you, you have a link to the GitHub repo hosting this, uh, which is uh, this repo here. And the app is basically uh, just here. So this is the full app. So you can do something quite capable with just a very, very small amount of code. Let's go through it really quickly and then we just uh, spin it up. Um, here you have the root flow that we pass to the app, remember? The app is the runner, the flow, the, the runner wants a flow. Uh, so this logic that continuously reevaluate itself. And then you expose uh, UIs with a, with a, in a certain layout that we'll see in a second uh, live. Uh, so this is the UI part, uh, uh, which calls into uh, some Streamlink, U, simple Streamlink UI. And then, uh, and the Streamlink UI is actually this render function. So this render function will render the UI itself. And then you have the manager, the, the, the flow itself, which is a manager of notebooks. It contains dicts of, uh, of works. There are works that are individual machines doing, you can even run training on here, right? And each one of them is spun up dynamically. So it, this is infrastructure. Like it's like a, you know, a Kubernetes deployment being edited on the fly. So that you can actually, you know, uh, spin up, spin up uh, uh, machines, uh, but this is done uh, behind the scenes. And the actual, the only place where you can see the 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 the, the concept of a machine is here. Cloud compute. Cloud compute is an object that describes uh, what a, a, a compute something is, so that you can associate it to a work. Every work can take a cloud compute object and configure what kind of machine it will need to, to actually run. Um, and then we have the, the, the compute itself, uh, which kind of just shells out and calls the, the Jupyter uh, notebook. So this is an introduction of what you're about to see. Um, you can also download the zip for the source code locally. So let's do that. Let's go and uh, and see uh, what happens when I uh, when I download a compo uh, an app, and I see this is the downloaded app. Do you see it? Maybe I can make it a bit larger. Yeah, we can see it. Great. All right. So this is the app. This is the code that I just showed you. No changes. Um, and uh, the first thing you want to do is create uh, an environment. I'm going to use Conda, but it's uh, um, so that I can install the requirements for this. Like, let's take a look at the requirements. Jupyter Lab, of course, Notebook, which is another Jupyter related dependency, Streamlit for the for the UI, and then Lightning itself. All right. So we can say Conda create name. I don't know. Uh, Lightning demo. And uh, we're going to run with Python 3.9, just a recent version. We let it think for a minute. This is not our fault. This is Conda. <laughs> this is the demo, guys. Demo, demo got on Conda. So it's uh, OK, great. <laughs> there they are. Okay. Good. All right. And. Um, All right, Conda activate the demo. All right, and uh, we're gonna pip install requirement. 
sixty. Oh, sorry. Dash R. Okay, so that's great. Of course, Jupiter comes with a with quite many dependencies, and yeah. Yeah, a lot of things working on this. Always good to see. We it. should be done. <laughs> yeah. And just uh, installing those four dependencies brings in a lot of friends. Looks like, you know, your, your wedding, when you're planning your wedding. Oh, why don't we invite this cousin? Oh, we have to invite these other <laughs> folks too if you invite that one. Yeah, table man. All of a sudden, you have a thousand people at your wedding. <laughs> anyway. Cool. So I, I guess just yeah. understanding, um, a, a little bit of this so you know if you if you take the world where you don't necessarily have this is this just all essentially a system that i would otherwise be having to build like it, it, you know it, it feels like a lot of these things as far as dependencies libraries it's kind of executing this for me and making it but it, i guess is yeah, that this is not specific yeah it's not specific to lightning itself right it's uh but it's a it's a thing that um like if we have components that are just pip installable packages, then my dependency story will be primarily solved by pip itself, which is a plus, right? Right. I don't have to kind of patch things at different level of abstractions together in order to make them uh, work. Okay, finally, it's done. Um, all right. So right now, I can start my app by saying lightning run app app.apply, and this will run locally. So I give it a second to start. I'm suspecting that running Teams on, oh, sorry, a Zoom on this thing is gonna, <laughs> yeah, so I need to get a, a, a network. A beefier one, yeah. <laughs> but it's staying, it won't take long, so we're gonna believe it. Oh, by the way, if you just, clone and run from here, oh, sorry. What I'm showing you is the experience of getting the source code, getting in, you know, trying it locally and then pushing on the cloud. But it's really important to understand that everything that I'm doing is not a requirement. If you just want to scratch, scratch but up, you just click on clone and run and I'm going to do it. And this is going to just start my app on Lightning the app that I chose, and it's doing the exact thing that, yeah, you will see a lot of dependencies, of course, you know, being installed here because they are installed in the cloud. And so the machine has already been provisioned, it's downloading the code and it will install the dependency, start the app and so on. And uh, uh, we, yeah, we, we can look at the compute as soon as the machines will, all the machines will be provisioned or will have visibility on what machines are running on the cloud. So what I did to get to this point, it just click on clone and run. But if you want a full experience of, of uh, you know, getting in the weeds of things, then this is the app that is running. If you see up here, it's running on my local, right? The beauty of this is that it's running on my local. It's not uh, requiring anything else but Python. But the logic of my application, the file that I showed you, will run in an identical way locally or on the cloud. Uh, just by flipping up the dash dash cloud switch, but the logic itself will not change. So it's not that if I'm local, then I need to kind of bring up some services on the cloud. I need to talk to some services. I need to figure out how the different containers are deployed in a different way from from uh, from local. If I understand how to make my my uh, code work um, uh, locally. In, in in make the components talk to each other through the state updates, then I'm done. Then I can run it on the cloud. It will run in the distributed fashion, but the logic will be the same and I don't have to take care of that. Um, so for example, this, uh, uh, let's, let's put myself and uh, create a Jupyter notebook. And you can see here, there's another tab being created and uh, I can just go here and it's, in this case, in local, it's starting a new process where it's starting off like a, a full Jupyter lab thing, right? 
what happens, and it's still on my machine. So of course I cannot train on GPU because I'm on a Mac, not an M1 Mac. Uh, but, <laughs> but on the cloud, what happens on the cloud is that um, this thing will be distributed. Let, so let's try to do the thing where I show you how to, from local, spin it up on the cloud. So say I, I modify this slightly, right? And this is what it takes for me to actually start my own version of the Scratch, scratch button app on the cloud. I, I typed dash dash cloud. This will package up your app from here to the cloud and it will be executing the same thing that it's executing on the other side. Here, it's uh, uh, this is the instance that I started using clone and run. This is the instance that I just started uh, from local uh, and, and pushed to the cloud. And what it's happening right now is whatever was co-located in a multi-processing environment locally will be broken apart. So the flows will stay together, the work, that in this case, there's no work that starts right away, but it starts when I click on the on the Jupyter like start notebook thing. That thing will be another machine sitting somewhere else running some you know different container and the containers will run the logic that I wrote in the work. And the two things will just seamlessly communicate. I don't need to, to know about that. Um, yeah, so let's uh, wait a second for this to happen. Again, you can download the code. So every time I push or every app that I get from the gallery, if the author has decided that I should be able to see the code, I can get the code. Of course, that same code probably will be linked somewhere on, on GitHub and I can interact on there, but I can also just get the code, change it as I showed you, and then push it on the cloud, run my own version and uh, and just have it at scale, just like uh, what I get on, on, the, on the gallery. So we hear that a ton okay. from customers community of just like reproducibility challenges. I mean, does this, in your opinion, does this help sort of if, if alleviate that challenge, right? Of just, it's, it sounds well, like, absolutely. yeah. Okay. So it being able to just take something, whether it's an app that's on the gallery or something that you've created and know it's going to work consistently. Um, I think that there's a lot of help there because at least from what I've heard is uh, that there winds up being a ton of time just trying to make something work in the same way on, you know, somebody's machine versus another person's machine uh, versus having yeah. this seemingly, it, it seems very portable. Is that the right way to look at this as well? Yeah. yeah, it's very portable. And the portability is not just, you know, in different points in time, so I can reproduce whatever I did, but it's also across clouds, across clusters, right? So, or across teams, uh, so there's a team that developed a, in a, my company that developed a great app and I can tell you no know, colleagues in another team that don't want to use my system, but they want to use their replica of this system, maybe tweak it a little bit. And it becomes really easy to do, right? Um, so the app is starting now and, uh, uh, and this open app button uh, just uh, became active and I can of course stop it, but I will avoid doing that. Um, and then, uh, I can open the app here. It will link to a part, like a hard to guess link uh, where um, it's we are outside of the Lightning platform at this point. So the Streamly thing is uh, starting up. All right. So we have kind of the same interface that you saw before. Again, it's oops, it's me, and I want to start uh, a notebook from here. Now let's, uh, running on the cloud has a, another advantage, which is um, you get a, a view of the machines that are spun up. So through this admin thing, it's pretty nice to see. So right now I, I request the CPU only thing. So uh, uh, I will get one CPU, 10 gigabytes, you know, very small machine. It's all configurable through that cloud compute thing. So you can also provision, you know, change this up so that it provisions really beefy machines on your cloud provider. This is just an example, of course. Um, and so this is, uh, again, starting another node, put them in communication through some queue mechanisms so that the states are now uh, synchronized. And uh, 
we go back, we go to Jupyter Lab here, and as, so, as, as soon as all the dependencies are installed on this new work that I spun up, then uh, I will be able to access the, the Jupyter uh, Lab instance here. Uh, but I want to just uh, go back to the manager and uh, like say, Toma wants to use a GPU node and then we create uh, uh, another work that's um, another instance of the uh, of the uh, of Jupyter Lab, but running on the GPU node now. This will take a tad longer to provision because we have to wait for AWS to kind of actually give us a node and, and a node that we um, we requested. One of the fancy things here is that you can say, okay, now I have a few components, and the components you can see the components. Um, that we saw before in the in the source code, right? So we have the root manager, uh, so the manager of the notebooks, and then we have two works that have been have spun up dynamically because I requested it. I requested them from inside the app. One is a CPU only. One is with one GPU. They're all connected to the state mechanism, and you can see kind of filter the logs. Let's see what logs are you know originating from Tomasis. It's pending because this GPU node probably is requested by multiple people. So it takes a, a bit longer to provision. CPU machines are a much, much faster and we pre-provision them so that your experience is really fast. Uh, but if you work on your own BPC, you can, and you know you're gonna hit this a lot, a lot of times, you can actually pre-provision a GPU instance so that people that need to be super effective and you know start in. 10 seconds can do that because it's your choice to over provision machines at that point. It's your own VPC. You can do whatever you want. But now um, the, the, the machine is up. Uh, so the, the, the logs will be appearing soon. Okay, these are the logs there. Um, they're being collected. So dependencies are being installed here. So let's see if my GPU instance is ready here. So, while that's uh, spinning up, Luca, I, I, conscious yeah. of uh, you know just time, do we want to open it up to to some questions for? Oh, for sure. While this is like thinking, like, let's open it up for sure. Awesome. Yeah. So, to the to the audience, if there are any questions coming in, uh, I saw one that I had received that I hadn't answered yet, uh, which was. Asking, okay, can this be used locally as well as on the cloud? We already answered that is yes. Does the platform work with TensorFlow and JAX today? Yeah, it's like, although they're both like both trainer and work and flow are located in the same library, there's no need for training jobs to be implemented using trainer. Of course, you should do that. <laughs> but if you have a very specific JAX requirement, I don't know, you're, you're doing uh, some uh, physics, inverse physics, and so on, and JAX is really great at that. Yeah, for sure. You can you can uh, run a work that runs a JAX or TensorFlow uh, job in it and still expose variables out. Uh, there are a few things that, for example, fault tolerance. Lightning has the concept of within batch fault tolerance. So you can have a training that goes on and then if you send it a termination signal, the whole training at that point in time, so not at the beginning of the epoch, not at the beginning of the training, but at that iteration, everything, all the information in the training loop are serialized so that you can then start it back at that same point in time. So of course, these things take a lot of work to, to accomplish. And other frameworks don't have them. So of course, if you're running with a uh, you know, Lightning Trainer, you're gonna have some superpowers that you're not gonna have with other uh, frameworks or unless you build them yourself. But apart from that, yes, absolutely. You can you can do whatever you want. Awesome. Uh, and then there was just a, a question. If we want to partner, is there a person to reach out to? Uh, Yes, you can get us through through a couple of different uh, means. You can certainly reach out, uh, join our Slack community and uh, just reach out in the, the general questions channel on that Slack. Uh, you can also email us, uh, you know, either um, to our 
uh, just sort of info at PyTorch Lightning, or uh, you can email me directly and I'll direct you to the right thing. It's just mike at lightning.ai. So for anybody on there that is interested in it, yes, please do reach out. We're always uh, looking at that. This is certainly an ecosystem and community uh, focused kind of um, uh, focused project and company. So uh, any opportunity we have there, we'd love to, to hear from you, what you're working on and how it can potentially help. Cool. So sorry to interrupt there, Luca. Uh, it looks like we- No, no, it's, it's fine. Like I, I just show that, you know, if I go to the Tomas's, uh uh, Jupyter Lab instance, uh, and you open a terminal, you will see NVIDIA uh, SME, and then you have a, a GPU running, so you can run your stuff from here. So that's about that. Like it's a small demo, but it teaches you how to kind of manage uh, works dynamically, and it's very very short code. So imagine what you can do with very like a medium sized code, and you will see that because we're working on something really cool. Uh, you can also take a look at the Omniverse app. Uh, which is an app that we built in collaboration with NVIDIA that will, um, uh, I will just show you the gallery entry for it. Um, so this is a, uh, an app that we have in beta today uh, that uh, uses NVIDIA Omniverse Replicator to generate virtual environments that are actually annotated. So you get ground truth data on those. So you can say, okay, I choose my environment, which is, I don't know, a warehouse, and I, I need to detect you know, carts. So you, you can seed carts in a random fashion across the warehouse. And what you get in, in output is a set of images. It's a data set with images and annotations with bounding boxes of carts in various positions. Of course, it's all randomized. And then you can also train it with an AutoML approach uh, state-of-the-art uh, vision uh, models on that uh, on that data set and then compare the results across models uh, and then download the model that you like the most uh, in terms of performance. Or you can just download the data set that is automatically generated. Uh, and so, of course, this is to uh, avoid having to kind of acquire data in the real world for situations that are really, really hard to, to get. And you can also upload your models as well. So... And this, of course, you know, has a level of complexity that is much higher than what I showed you, but still the app is not very large. And uh, interestingly, it has a React UI. So you can build UIs, not just with Streamlit, of course, we have support for any JavaScript framework. So if you have the ability to code up a, a React um, app, uh, then you can connect it with the state management under the hood. And again, you don't have to worry about a lot. Uh, just you know, the logic of your application. Awesome. Well, I, I think we're we're well on. So appreciate everyone uh, spending the time with us today. This was awesome. Thank you, Luca, for walking us through like all of the the platform, all of the guts of this. I think there's a, a ton of awesome information for this that's going to make it useful for people. I'm sure certainly the folks that are on today, as well as the ones that will watch this later. So thank you to everyone uh, for joining us. If you want to get started, you can just join Lightning, go to lightning.ai, get an account. As Luca mentioned, it is free. You receive free credits to actually use and uh, start interacting with apps, creating your own, cloning them and running them. And uh, certainly if you want you know, help or support in any of those ways, reach out to us on Slack or reach out to us using the contact us function on the website. And we'd be more than happy to chat with you. Love to always see what the community is working on and how we can help to support it. Um, so with that, thank you all again for joining. Thank you, Luca. Uh, we'll we'll be here and look forward to seeing you all uh, on the Slack and in, in various other places, uh, hopefully in real life. Oh, there are some upcoming community events, so we'll be at those. If you do see us, hopefully we'll, for the most part, have the, uh, the purple on and the lightning bolt. So please do come say hi, introduce yourself. Again, it, it's always fun meeting the, yeah, exactly. I've got mine on under here. <laughs> it's always fun meeting people that you're you're slacking with and talking with online uh, in real life. So yeah, looking forward to seeing you all out there and uh, very excited to see what you build.